Uh, Heavenly Father, God, you are a good father. Um, God, you are a good father, we, as we sang and declared, God. May we, um, as we come and continue in worship and open the scriptures and take communion and discuss with one another and, and sing and all of that, Lord, may we be shaped more and more into your people. Um, God, may this be a time where we allow ourselves to be a bit vulnerable to your word. Um, God, that you may highlight areas of our life and um, in areas that we need to be critiqued and changed. And may you also bring encouragement where encouragement is needed. Um, but God, may this be a space for you to move and work in our souls and our minds and our hearts. Um, God, as we come to be more and more shaped into you. So God, we give you this space um, and we invite you into this space even though you are present. Um, and so God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this past week, uh, my five-year-old, Madison, um, who has been doing dance since she is two, so she can pretty much say her whole life, um, has been doing this ballet and jazz and all that. And this past week, she had two ballet intensives, right? How intimidating does that sound, uh, right? She had two ballet intensives. And these were um, two three-hour dance classes for a five-year-old. It's the cutest three hours you've ever seen in your life. Um, just a bunch of five and or eight and under, two twos running around. Uh, fantastic, right? But, but it, is a, it is a part of this, this process or this program we've got her into um, where she is now a part of her dance school's performing company, all right? So any with dance background, this is, believe me, I have not danced like maybe at one wedding once, all right? If I dance. So this whole world is new to me. Um, but, but she's a part of this performing company. <clears throat> And a part of that is she now has um, four of these dance intensives. So she's done two. The next two are jazz intensives. Um, frightening, I know. Um, but jazz intensives. And then she'll also have going forward, starting in a couple of weeks, she'll have two classes a week, right, for this five-year-old um, to learn to dance. Well, one of the reasons we wanted her to get into this dance is partially because she, um, she loves to be in front of people. Um, she'll play like she's shy, but she's not. Don't let her fool you. Um, but, uh, but she, what, what I've learned through through kind of team sports and those sorts of things that I've done my whole life, um, is there are a ton of like, great lessons to learn in those, right? Um, things like teamwork and hard work and, and all of that sort of stuff. Well, one of the things that we really want to instill in her is this issue of hard work. Um, a couple months ago, she had been playing out in the living room and she had kind of made a mess. And I said, hey, Madison, it's time to, um, time to you know, pick up your stuff. We're getting ready for bedtime. And she goes, ah, oh, dad, that's a lot of hard work. <laughs> I said, yeah. She goes, oh. and no joke. She looks at me and says, can I just get a boy to do it for me? <laughs> I was like, oh, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. Um, so apparently we're sending all sorts of wrong messages and making a mess of my daughter. Uh, but so we said, we got to figure out how to instill some hard work in her. Um, be a strong, independent woman, little Madison, Princess Madison. Um, so, so anyway, all that say is, as I was reminded this week, though, of, of you know, because one of the things that she wants to do, she wants to dance, she wants to do soccer, and she wants to get in all these things. But our, our kind of family rule, at least as of now, as a parent of, of a five year old, which um, really is pretty easy in the grand scheme of things. Um, uh, but, but one of the things we've instituted is that you can only do kind of one thing per season. All right, so you can't do soccer and dance and all of that. And, um, because I think in our culture, right, we kind of celebrate the idea of busyness. You know what I mean? And at a young age, we, we want our, like, our kids to just be busy, 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 busy. And so we're trying. I mean, it'll work now. I'm sure we'll screw it up later because I really want her to play soccer and all those things. Although, believe me, she's not a soccer player, all right? She is a dancer through and through. Uh, but, but we want her to kind of get involved in those things. But it was reminding me that, that often, uh, you know, in, in our culture, there is a dominant kind of narrative that's flowing through it, right? And some of it is great and good and has brought a lot of good things. Others have been poor and have brought some damage to um, to kind of the world story, if you will. And, and we live as Christians kind of as this alternative community within the dominant narrative. And so we do things like one of the reasons I don't want her to do all of these sorts of things is I don't want her identity to be in these extracurricular activities. Right? But kind of the, the narrative that the world says is that we have to put forth this resume of, of we've did this and I went to this college and I achieved all this and I had straight A's and I was perfect and all those sorts of things. But there is something in the Jesus way where we fight against that narrative. And it reminded me as we were reading um, this week for the church in Pergamon that we'll get to, is that we live this kind of distinct life amongst this greater culture, right? And, and one of the, when we read scripture, I think the common narrative that we pick up out of scripture is we tend to look at um, us in the West, us in America and the American church as Israel in the promised land. Okay? When Israel was in the promised land, they were the dominant culture. 
Okay, that tends to be the lens we look through scripture with. But what I want to argue is that maybe the metaphor from the, the, the scriptures we need to revive a bit and take on to ourselves isn't Israel in the promised land, but it's Israel in exile. Right, because in exile, they were living distinct from Babylon around them. They had been defeated. They didn't have a land. The monarchy and the kings and the judges, they had kind of been destroyed. They were non-existent anymore. Rather, they were living under a different cultural narrative. And for us in America, we have to kind of separate these out, and maybe we need to revive this picture of living as the church in exile. Doesn't mean we retreat to the desert and we hide and we stay away from everything, but rather we live in the midst of another culture that is an alternative, distinct way. Right? That's why I titled this message, Faithfully Distinct. Because I think we have to find this way. What do we do? How do we live in a culture where, where the way of Jesus is not the dominant story? Yes, we are, uh, you know, you could depend on how you want to define it. We are a Christian nation. Yes, the majority of people are Christians, but I think the way of Jesus may differ a bit from the American way, that we have to live a bit distinct. And so we're going to um, look at that a bit. One of the uh, passages I think is apropos for that is um, Jeremiah 29. You guys know 11. Um, some of you probably know verse 7, which I think um, proceeds right before, right? In Jeremiah 29, 7, uh, he said, God says, seek the shalom of the city. He says, where you are in exile, and he's speaking to the church in exile, he says, seek the welfare of the city you're in, because in its thriving, you too will thrive. And then he gets to verse 11, right, which we plaster all over our walls and our coffee mugs, but maybe a bit of a um, historical lesson here. The plans that God has in mind for us there, right, or what he had for Israel, was that Jerusalem was about to be burned and the temple destroyed, all right, so we put that on our coffee mug. We're like, good morning. Uh, but it's like, Ugh, you know what I mean? It's a bit like, like we just got to, and, and he, he brings them back to the promised land, yes, but we have to understand the plans at hand were probably not what we envision, right? It was that they had to live faithfully distinct in exile amongst this other culture that was the dominant picture. And so we as followers of Jesus have to begin to ask that, how do we seek the shalom of the city, living in this country that we do love and are grateful for and all of that, but it isn't perfect. And, and I think I'm going to critique a few things, but I wanted to say I'm grateful for the country that we live in, um, but it's not perfect. And we live distinctive that our role is not to make America the kingdom of God, but to bring the kingdom of God where we are in America. That's an important distinction, um, and we're going to look a bit at that. So um, Revelation chapter 2, uh, we again are looking at these seven letters that Jesus writes to the churches in Asia. Um, the past two weeks, I've done a bit of a history lesson, and I will do that again for us um, this morning. But just like returning from a bad family vacation, I have brought pictures um, to make it maybe a bit better. Um, and so uh, let's, let's learn a bit um, about um, Pergamum. Let's look at verse 12 in Revelation chapter 2 text says this, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, All right? One of the best tools you can have in studying scripture is, and it's the best tool that I've been given through kind of mentors um, in my life, is question everything. As you read, why are these words written here? Why is Pergamum there? When you come to a location in the scriptures, a great question to ask is, what do we know of Pergamum? What do we know in scripture? Is it mentioned anywhere else? What do we know historically about Pergamum that maybe would help illuminate the words that were to come? And so um, a bit about Pergamum. I want to do that in two ways, like I've done the past two weeks. Um, I want to look at the religious background and as well as the political environment, okay, or the way they were loyal to Rome. Um, so Pergamum incredibly, incredibly religious city. Um, there were four main gods who kind of claimed their headquarters, if you will, in Pergamum. The first of which, um, to start the family vacation, um, <laughs> that's a bad joke, uh, is Athena, right? Some of us, we recognize Athena from um, elementary school when we studied Greek mythology. Athena was the goddess of war and wisdom. Okay, on the left there, you see a statue of Athena. Uh, by the way, this is all deep research on Google images. Okay, this was not, um, this was not my personal pictures. Um, and then on the right, you see Athena's temple. That's a reconstruction. Um, I believe it's at a museum in Berlin um, where they've reconstructed what that temple would look like. Well, you would worship Athena seeking um, wisdom and guidance in war and all of that. That was um, one of the core gods um, in Pergamon. There were many. These are just the four that were the most dominant. Um, the next god, Asclepius. Asclepius was the god of healing. And you can see on the right, they made a statue in my likeness, might I add. Uh, 
I'm full of dad jokes today, all right? Um, but but uh, there's this statue of Asclepius. On the left, you see the ruins um, today of, of the Asclepian. Um, the Asclepian was essentially a hospital. Okay, that's like the best way um, to, to describe it. But the Asclepian was, um, you would go... And he's very much associated with medicine. Um, but you would go and you would bring, um, like if you had an illness or whatnot, you would go, they would put you in a room, much like a hospital room. Um, they would give you some sort of substance that would kind of put you into a deep sleep. And the idea was you would then have a vision of how to be healed. And uh, you would wake up and they'd say, okay, now do this, 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 and this. Uh, and you would either be healed or not healed. Um, well, next slide. Um, some of you may notice that that statue had a staff with a snake around it. Uh, Asclepius means snake, and it is where on all of our kind of medical symbols, you know, I put that one there, you see the snake and the staff. That goes all the way back to Asclepius. Um, that's where we draw that image. Well, if you were healed, like I mentioned, um, below, you would then create a sculpture of the body part that was healed, and you would offer it to Asclepius as a sort of gratitude to keep him appeased or whatnot. So those are not actual body parts. Um, I don't tend to take pictures of body parts. Um, but, but there is a actual gifts that they had brought to Asclepius. And so um, that was kind of the, the way it worked. You would bring that as an act of gratitude, as a way of um, appeasing Asclepius. Um, the next God, Dionysus, again, another one we may have heard, the God of wine and fertility, the God of a good time, um, uh, Dionysus. And uh, on the left, you see the statue there. On the right, you'll see the ruins of the temple of Dionysus. And it's the one kind of in the far back, kind of set back in the image there. Um, on the right there, you see those things that look like steps. Um, that is actually seats in the Pergamum Theater. Okay, the Pergamum Theater sat on the side of this mountain and sat 10,000 people. Okay, massive, massive. And Dionysus and the theater were very much intertwined. That's why they are next to each other, which is the reason I chose this picture, is you would go to this theater and you would take in a show. Um, there were shows of Dionysus and the gods and all of that. And after taking in the show, you would go down to the stage and the stage would kind of hinge and function as the entrance to the temple of Dionysus. And so at the temple of Dionysus, um, you would drink all sorts of wine, and it was kind of spoken of that you were taking in the spirit of Dionysus, right? Interesting when you think of Paul's words in Corinthians, where he says, we don't get drunk on that wine, but rather we are filled with the spirit of God. Um, just a freebie for you. Um, interesting. But uh, so he, you would take in all of this um, wine. As you can imagine, this massive party uh, would kind of break out. And uh, they were a bit uh, promiscuous, you could say. And so they were a bit loose with their sexuality as well at these parties. And so I'll let your mind figure out what, the, what happened there. Uh, but that was kind of the, the goddess or the god of Dionysus. And lastly, one we all recognize, Zeus. Um, there's a, a, a bust of Zeus with a manly beard, which is why I grow a beard. It makes me feel stronger. Um, but, uh, but there is Zeus, and uh, of course, he's the king of the gods, um, the sky god, the thunder god, all of that. And in uh, Pergamum, there was this altar here. Okay, Now, this altar is not the temple. This is just the altar in Pergamum. And it sat, um, like I mentioned, Pergamum was up on the side of the hill. And they would have this, and it would face um, kind of towards the open area, or towards kind of the rest of the world, if you will. And if you look closely, you can kind of tell, uh, if I had a picture from above, it'd be a little easier. But it's kind of shaped in a U, right? Well, the idea was that that was a giant throne, Right? And I wish I would have had a picture with like a, a person in it so you can kind of get some reference on how big this actually is. Um, the, you see on the kind of the two sides, there's like, it looks like there's images of people. Um, those are like actual size people. Right? So it's like, it is huge, right? a massive, massive thing. And so this would sit on the side of a mountain. And, and the idea was that because Zeus is so massive, he needs a massive throne to sit on and rule the world. Um, and so they would often um, worship uh, Zeus. And so this is kind of the religious environment of Pergamum. Well, um, just like Ephesus and Smyrna, as I've mentioned the past two weeks, um, Roman or the imperial cult uh, was also a, a heavy influence uh, in, uh, in Pergamum. And so they would, uh, they would worship Rome and the emperors because if Rome and Caesar have all the power and have all the money, well, then if we can show that we're loyal to them, maybe they'll give us a bit of a kickback. 
right? Or if someone attacks us, we can rely on the wrath of Rome coming down on someone because we are loyal to Rome. And so what broke out in Pergamum was uh, in, in uh, 29 BC, Emperor Augustus uh, gave permission for them to build a temple to himself, which is like awesome, by the way. Build a temple for me, right? Like, uh, and so he builds this temple for himself, or he tells them he, they can, and so there begins this kind of emperor worship. I, don't, I did, couldn't find a picture of that one. Um, a little while later, Emperor Trajan, uh, who the ruins are still standing, I didn't bring a picture of that. We didn't make it on that part of the tour. Uh, I'm just joking. Uh, but, but their Emperor Trajan had a, uh, had a temple as well. And, and, and the idea, again, was that if we are loyal to Rome, more so than any other city, then Rome will have favor with us. And so the, the emperors at an early time when they, they began, right, because they rule the known world from England to India, they're ruling. So it is a mad, I mean, they are the world power. And so they had this kind of persona that would come on and they would say things like, we are the sons of God coming to bring a universal peace and prosperity, right? Familiar language for Christians, right? They would say things like I've said the past couple weeks, like Caesar is Lord, and so they would have these elaborate festivals to honor um, the emperor. One of the things unique to Pergamum was that um, they had, had um, issued the governor of kind of the broader Asian area lived in Pergamum. Um, okay, so sent from Rome, lived in Pergamum, and he had what's called the right of the sword. And the right of the sword meant that he could implement the death penalty for really any reason and at any time. Um, usually that would have to go to Rome. There'd be a trial or that sort of thing. You see Jesus go before a series of trials, um, that sort of thing. But they had given him the right of the sword, meaning he could execute the death penalty whenever he wanted. Uh, so this is the world of Pergamum, right? Like, and you would walk around and as you're, I mean, imagine walking through a downtown and you see all these buildings around you and you're like, oh, that's Athena and Dionysus and, and Asclepius and Zeus and, and Trajan. And I mean, it would, it would be a bit overwhelming. It would surround you. And so you have this church then that, that is really, again, this is 90 BC after the death of Christ. So it is this new movement that's, that's small and it's coming onto the scene, um, but it's amidst this kind of culture. They were very much in a sort of exile. Right? They didn't have a land or a king to call their own. They were living amongst this culture. So um, let's read the, the letter now from start to finish, verses 12 through 17. And let's see, as you read, um, see if a few more things maybe pop a bit or come, um, come to life a bit more with that kind of in the background. So Revelation 2, verse 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who have the sharp two-edged sword... I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So he begins right at the beginning, right? He says, the words of him who have has the sword. The two-edged sword. He says Rome has a sword that represents power and authority and, and the ability to take life and give life, right? He says, but Jesus, the words of the one who's speaking, he says, I've also got a sword. And there's a bit of a bravado to it. He says, I am the ultimate authority. It may look, Pergamum, like Rome is in charge, but don't be fooled. He says, I've got a sword as well. And thankfully, this God wields the sword with a bit more grace and life, does he not? He says, I've got the sword. Then he goes on, he says, I know where you dwell, dwell where Satan's throne is, okay? All sorts of, of, of ideas of what this is. I, I believe what he's doing is he is drawing a connection to Zeus's throne or the altar, right? Is he is saying, and remember, Satan is, is the personification of evil. It may be a person. Um, certainly, I'm not denying that. But more often, I think in scripture, it's used as a personification of um, what it literally means, the adversary, and he says, listen, I know where you dwell. I see the culture around you. I see the dominant ways in which, which all of this religion is there. And Zeus has this altar and this throne, and he seems to reign. He says, I know where you dwell. He says, and he commends them. He says, yet you hold fast to my name. You held on. You, were, you found ways to live a distinct life. 
You held fast to my name. You did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Okay, we don't know a lot about Antipas. The most we know of Antipas is right here. Um, he was apparently a believer in Pergamum who was killed. The best guess would be that he um, refused to declare Caesar is Lord or those sorts of things that would bring the death penalty. Um, the fact that one martyr is named, opposed to like Smyrna last week, where the whole church was kind of under attack and facing martyrdom, um, <coughs> Excuse me. The idea of, of one being named probably means that martyrdom wasn't as widespread in Pergamum, um, that he was one who was killed, and so they identify one opposed to you all are facing death. Um, certainly that was there, um, but, but the, the mention of just the one probably alludes to that a, bat, a, a bit. And then he goes again, who again, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Excuse me. <clears throat> Again, Jesus is recognizing the culture they're in and saying, you have found ways to be distinct. He says, and he goes on in verse 14, though, he says, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and to practice sexual immorality. Well, again, as we read scripture, we see Balaam and we think, okay, what is going on there? What's that story? Numbers 22 through 25, I believe, is where we find the story of Balaam. And Balaam worked for the king Balak. Okay? And Balak at the time was concerned as Israel was wandering through the wilderness, they were going to pass through his kingdom, and he was concerned that they were going to overtake them. And so he hires Balaam, doesn't help that their names are like identical, um, but he hires Balaam to essentially curse, as a, he's a prophet or a sorcerer, and so he hires him to curse the people of Israel as he walks through their land so that they don't overtake him. Well, Balaam um, is kind of faced with this, and God comes to him and says, hey, you're not going to curse the people of God. And and so he says, okay, but I'll find a different way. And so he goes back to Balak and he tells him, hey, what if as they're passing through, you begin to do your kind of your, your worship services to these pagan gods. And then maybe you trounce out the women of Moab, which is what kind of entices the men. Um, right. And he says, essentially, when you do that, some of the Israelites will begin to fall into that pagan worship and will fall for your beautiful women. And it'll slowly erode the people of God from the inside out. Right? And so he says, some of you hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put that stumbling block. He says, apparently some in the church were, were persuading the Christians to say, hey, it's okay if you partake in this also. Because Balaam's teaching was essentially that you could accommodate kind of the, the, the culture around you. And so some of those Christians were saying, yeah, it's okay to worship Athena, it's okay if you have to say Caesar is Lord and Jesus is Lord because you know what? Your life's in the balance. So you might as well kind of accommodate a bit of that. Yeah, you can worship Asclepius. You got a broken leg. Yeah, go, go, go worship him. And so some have kind of have begun to do this. They had fallen into this food sacrifice. They worship these God, practice sexual morality. I think he's connecting that with Dionysus a bit. And he's saying, yeah, you can, you can do these sorts of things. It's okay. And then he goes on. So also, you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, I believe that the Nicolaitans and those that he talks about that hold to the teaching of Balaam, I think they're the same group. I think it's two ways of kind of saying the same thing. Remember in chapter two, verse six, to the letter in Ephesus, the Nicolaitans make an appearance. Um, and it says this, it says, yet this you have, speaking to the church in Ephesus, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans. All right, so this, this teaching, this accommodation is something that, that Jesus, kind of, it says that he hates it. Because he says, somehow amongst all of this, you have to remain distinct within this culture. Right now, as most of us study this, as I study in elementary school, as I read it now, we look at these kind of gods, right? We see, uh, you know, Athena and, and um, we see all of these different gods, Dionysus and Asclepius, all of these. And we think, man, how barbaric. Or like how barbaric that they would worship, like we don't worship gods. We don't have these statues we go, we don't go to these temples and worship all these gods in our culture. That's medieval, it's, it's, it's you know, primitive, it's whatever. It's, it's just totally barbaric. Well, what I wanna present is maybe it's a bit more close to home than we think. All right, I think we may not serve and worship statues per se, but I think there are things in American culture that, that are pulsing through kind of uh, our veins as Americans, whether we want to or not. It's just kind of a part of who we are. And we have to, to find those ways. Maybe there are some gods that we do worship. Um, and so I brought a quote by a guy named Walter Brueggemann. 
And Walter Brueggemann is an Old Testament scholar. Um, he wrote a book, Mandate to Difference. And in that book, he's inviting the church, essentially to use my language, live distinct among the culture. And he offers um, a bit of a critique of American um, society and culture that we live in, um, and particularly is directed at the church. And, uh, and so he brings this, and this is at the end of his book, and he's using this metaphor of the script. And so you'll see that at the beginning of the quote where, where essentially we are living a script and we need to find ways to maybe offer an alternative script. So he writes this. He says, the dominant scripting of both selves and communities in our society for both liberals and conservatives, is the script of therapeutic, technological consumer militarism. We'll come back to that. That permeates every dimension of our common life. It is difficult indeed to imagine life in our society outside the reach of this script that is everywhere reiterated and legitimated among us. Okay, what he says is that this dominant script in American society comes down to these four words, therapeutic, technological, consumer militarism. So what's he mean by that? First, therapeutic. He is writing, he, he has this idea that as Americans, we have, because of our wealth, because of our status, we have the ability to cure any pain or ailment that we have. Right? So we numb them with consumerism. We numb them with being able to buy whatever we want. This is why we spent $600 billion on Christmas last year right, as Americans. Six, uh, average family, $830 on gifts for Christmas. Right? Like, like we have the availability to, to therapeutically cure all, everything that ails us. Man, you're feeling bored and lonely. You can numb your mind with a bit more of The Office on Netflix. Right, which is one of my favorites. But uh, we can like, we can, you know, we have all of this within our grasp. You can cure, you can, you can, you know, solve any issue that you may face. We have the means to be able to do that. Secondly, which actually I should mention, that sounds a bit like Asclepius, doesn't it? Like maybe we go worship at the altar of things because there's something about that wrapping when we pull it off that just feels good. And let's be honest, I get it. I get it. Sounds a bit like Asclepius. And then he goes on technological, and he's saying that, that we have bought the lie of modernity, that we can solve any issue, that we have within us the capability. Give us enough time. There's a problem to be solved. Just give us enough time. We'll figure it out. Right? Like, we buy that lie that we are kind of maybe a bit like Zeus. We are the king of the gods, that we can solve everything. There's no need for the, the mysterious or the divine or the spiritual because we can solve the issues. Just give humans enough time and we can solve it. He goes on, consumerist, right? He says again that, that, that we have our means, our position in the world allows us to just take everything we want to make us kind of be prominent, to, to protect our way of life. Think about this. We are 5% of the world's population. We consume 25% of its resources, we're 5% of the world's population, but we consume 25% of the world's resources. Think about the damage of globalization. That yes, we can get things and clothing and all that for cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, but it's devastating people across the world because it's, it's not enough to provide ample work environments. It's an issue. That's an issue. And as the church, we have to find out how do we live distinct in that? What are we able to participate in and what are we not? Where do we need to maybe find ways to live an alternative script? And the last one, militarism. Uh, and by the way, consumerist, I would, I would equate with Dionysus, the god of a good time. I would equate with that. Militarism. I think obviously the connection here with Athena is that as the world's superpower, right? Like our national budget, we spent $600 billion on our military. That's more than the next seven countries combined. That's an, we have to figure out how do we live in that? How do we live in that? How do we live with, with that? And, and how do we recognize that we follow a rabbi who gave himself up, who is fundamentally nonviolent? We have to figure that out. How do we live distinct in that? And this should raise all sorts of questions. All, and it's far more complex than I can answer today, believe me. But, but we have to figure that out. How do we do that? The right of the sword, right? Since 1976, we have, since the death penalty was reinstated in America, we have executed 1,437 Americans. We have the right of the sword, don't we? Right? Like this is, again, how do we live distinct in this? And what Brueggemann would argue is that the militarism is really our way of protecting the therapeutic technological consumerism. That we can use that to really protect our way of life. This is a challenging way for us. 
And I think Jesus, just like he's speaking to Pergamum, he's speaking to us and he's saying, how do you live in this? And we ask those questions. We filter our way right through this lens of Jesus. And we filter that, that maybe we offer an alternative message to Dionysus and Athena and Asclepius and Zeus and the emperors and Caesar and Rome is do we find ways to seek the shalom of the city or the shalom of our country while still living distinct, right? Because look at what he says in verse 16. Right following that, he says, therefore, repent, right? Which again can be understood as think differently about the world. Turn around, go a different direction, He says, to the church who's under this Roman oppression who looks a whole lot of bit at times like America, and he says, repent. He says, repent, go the other way, think differently. And then he says, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. The them there is not the culture. The them there is the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans within the church. All right, make sure you get that. The them there is he will come and he will critique the church. He will war against the church with the sword of my mouth. That's probably best understood as the truth, right? We see that in Revelation 1. We see the sword coming out of his mouth. It's the words of God, the truth. He will come. He will war against those in the church that cannot stay distinct. He says, therefore, repent. Because again, the fundamental posture of the church is to live an alternative way, to offer a different sort of Asclepius, that we don't worship the altar of Asclepius. Instead, we go recognizing that God is in control, that we go recognizing not that we can buy whatever we want at the expense of whoever else so that we feel good about ourselves. We offer an alternative script. We, we follow a non-violent rabbi. We, we pursue humbly solutions to the world knowing that God is in control. That we offer this different picture of Dionysus, this different picture of everything in its proper perspective. We spend money in ways that reflect kingdom values. We live generously and open-handed with things. We, we, we give to others for looking out for the vulnerable and the marginalized and the oppressed. Right, at our expense. He says that is how the kingdom of God works. Because in reality, church, it, it's, it's an issue of trust, isn't it? It's an issue of, of, of what Jesus is giving the church. He's saying, do you trust Zeus and Athena and Dionysus and Asclepius and the emperors? Do you trust them or do you trust Jesus? Do you trust these other sources? Because that's the way of accommodation, right? Is, is, well, I follow Jesus until this, and then it's like, okay, I need a bit of that God here. I need a bit of this to bring into the fold. I need a little of that because I can't really survive. And so do we ultimately trust Jesus? Because as the church living in exile, living amongst the dominant culture, there will be times when it's a bit of a rub. It's difficult. It's hard. It'll cost us things. It'll cost maybe a bit of our comfort and and our luxury because as we follow Jesus, we have to continue to ask this question of do I fully trust Jesus? Jesus. Because the way of Jesus is distinct from the culture around us. Well, one of the things I note in this is that he never really gives detailed instructions to Pergamum, does he? He just kind of says, be distinct, right? Like, he just kind of says, maintain, hold fast to my name. But he doesn't say, do this with Zeus, this with Athena, this with Dionysus, and on and on and on. I think the reason he does that is because for all of us, that's a bit of a messy process. It will look different for each of us. It will look different the way that we have to filter the world through, through Jesus' eyes and say, can I spend my money in this way? Can I, can I participate in this? Can I, whatever it is. How am I seeking the shalom of the city? That will look messy and a bit different for each of us. But I love the way he ends the letter because he does so with a promise, right? Or three promises. He says this in verse 17. <clears throat> he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Okay, he says he'll give the manna, the stone, and a new name. All right, well, the manna, that should immediately draw our minds back to Exodus, right? As Israel is is wandering through the desert, they've just escaped slavery in Egypt. They're wandering around for 40 years, kind of lost in the wilderness, and God sends manna, or like it's kind of a flaky bread substance, to, to sustain them. I think Jesus is reminding the church in Pergamum, he's saying, as you attempt to stay distinct, as you walk the way of Jesus against the dominant culture, I will sustain you. I will give you strength. When you fail, I will give you manna to get you back up on your feet. 
right? The hidden manna was this manna that God told Moses to, to kind of bottle up and put in the Ark of the Covenant. It was this kind of, this, this extra blessing that you would, you would follow, but you would be given this kind of sustenance that maybe you didn't need to partake in the food sacrificed to pagan gods, like I said earlier in the text, but you can participate in this manna. Then he says that you'll get this white stone, and, and honestly, Scholars really have no idea what this is, to be honest. Here's, a, here's a, a, a kind of a window into maybe what it could be, but there's, there's like a thousand different opinions on this. But in, in, this, uh, in the first century world, when a gladiator would win a battle, okay, they would receive a white stone. And the white stone was a token of victory. It was a token of privilege. Um, for some, there's accounts that it would, be, um, it would exempt you from having to fight again. Um, and so to some degree, it would, it would essentially say that you don't have to fear death anymore which we can kind of draw some connection there as well. It is, essentially, it, is a, it is a prize for conquering. I think Jesus is saying that I will give you the hidden man, I will sustain you, I'll also recognize you and give you that token of privilege. Like, like you have, there, there were benefits that would come alongside this. It's Jesus saying, good job. And then he says, on that will be a new name written on the stone that no one knows except for the one who receives it. I think he's drawing this illusion to say, when you overcome, when you receive this stone, you will have a new name in the family of God. You will be adopted in. That you have been brought under the fold, that, that you have come under the good, good father, as we sang earlier. That you have become a new child of God. Think of Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians, right, in chapter 5, when he says, those that are in Christ are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. See, Jesus encourages them, says, as you live distinct, he says, as you live this faithfully distinct life, I will sustain you. As you go against the mainstream of the culture that wants to pull you away, and it's difficult, and it's hard, and it's confusing, and how do we find this way to live the way of Jesus? He says, I will give you strength. He says, when you struggle to trust God, I will give you a little bit to take that next step. I will give you that little bit of strength, that new name, that, that hidden manna as you bring an alternative way of life. He says, church, hold on. Encourage them, hold fast to my name. It may look like Rome is winning, but listen, hold on. I've got the manna for you. Church, may we, as the followers of Jesus, find ways to, to, to follow this distinct alternative way. May it shape all of our decisions. May it shape the way we spend money, the way we view others, the way we look at even national policies and, and the way that we, we interact with the culture around us. May we be shaped into the people of God. May we seek the shalom of the city because in its blessing, we too will be blessed. But church, this is a hard road. It's difficult, as narrow as Jesus would say. Few find it. But he says, follow that path, live distinct, because I will sustain you in that. Amen. So will you pray with me as we close and prepare for communion? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, God, we, uh, we come, Lord, knowing that this is difficult. And that we live in a culture that, yes, has lots of good in it, but also lots of bad in it, that pulls us away in different directions that are contrary to the way you would have us live. And so, God, in the ways that, that, that we find the goodness in creation, may we champion that. And, and in the ways that, that maybe are counter to the things of God, may we, may we critique that and find ways to remain distinct. God, would you help us and encourage us? Give us the manna, the sustenance, the, the, the strength to carry on when we're tired of explaining ourselves or trying to follow this way. God, may you remind us with your presence. May you remind us that you are here. So we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.